Welcome to your Essential Business Briefing. I'm Stephen Carroll, coming up. Preparing for work life after the pandemic. The lessons we can learn from the self-employed as some companies make plans for a return to the office. The risk of a debt crisis for many developing countries as a UN report warns that pandemic relief hasn't gone far enough. And click and clink, how soaring online sales are helping French winemakers to cut out the middleman and sell directly to the consumer. As COVID-19 vaccination rates ramp up, major tech companies are among those preparing to go back to the office. Twitter has told employees they can work from home indefinitely, but Google says it wants workers in the United States to be back on site, at least partially, by September. After that, anyone wanting to work remotely for more than 14 days a year will have to apply for special permission. So as employers start to think about life after the pandemic, what lessons should they and we as workers take from the past year? To discuss this, we're joined by Milena Nikolova, who's an economist specialising in labour and wellbeing. She's an associate professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands as well. Milena, thank you very much for being with us. Are you surprised to see companies like Google already saying that they expect people to go back to the office? Yeah, that's uh, not surprising at all. With uh, vaccinations underway in uh, many countries, it's uh, natural that country that companies are eager to uh, have their employees go back to the office. And on the other hand, you have also seen companies who have already announced uh, that they would want to do um, uh, teleworking, uh, that their employees can do it, teleworking indefinitely, such as Twitter. So for most companies, I expect that uh, the, uh, the uh, um, reality will be somewhere in the middle. So uh, a hybrid working mode where uh, some days workers will uh, work from the office and in, in some days they will, they will just stay at home. You've recently written a piece for Brugo which says that self-employed people could give us some useful ideas about how our jobs might be organised after all of this. What's the parallel between someone who's self-employed and someone who's working remotely? Yeah, there are several parallels. Uh, so, for example, both uh, the self-employed and those who are working from home can take advantage of uh, self-organisation. So that means that they are free to choose how, to some extent, how they can organize uh, their uh, their daily lives. They have more flexibility in terms of um, organizing their work tasks, but also fitting in some household chores if that may be necessary. Um, they they also have, in general, more autonomy and more control over over their jobs. And on the negative side, both the self-employed and teleworkers actually work very long hours and um, some of uh, these activities that, uh, that uh, people do at home or when, when they work uh, um, uh, self as the self-employed alone are associated with loneliness, with uh, increased burnout and with some, with some stress. So how should employers then tackle those problems? Are there more self-employed lessons, I suppose, that people can employ to make sure that they don't end up in that situation? Yeah, so uh, companies definitely have a, a role uh, to play here. So, for example, managers need to adopt uh, different strategies in how they uh, check on their employees. So, for example, in a, in a hybrid working mode, they can uh, schedule calls with them um, or frequently check uh, via email, via Zoom chats, video chats, etc. Um, and uh, uh, an additional policy in a, in a hybrid uh, working environment could be that uh, employers allow enough time for um, workers to socialize. And we know from, from a large body of research that the relationship with, that people have with their colleagues and uh, even superiors at work is very, very important for their well-being and the meaning that they derive from their work. So investing in um, such capabilities, uh, so, that, so in, in the offices where people can socialize or uh, socializing um, online could be, could be a good strategy that employers can, can take. How do you tackle the, the job satisfaction element of this? What's the, the ideal balance to make sure people have that sense of freedom uh, while also meeting the demands of their employers and being productive? 
So in my view, actually, the, the hybrid working mode is such a, um, such a, uh, a strategy that would allow to um, take the best of both worlds if implemented correctly and if employers ensure that uh, teleworkers or hybrid workers are treated fairly, that the conditions for teleworking are well um, um, spelled out and um, that uh, the uh, employees have the necessary training and equipment to be able to work both off and online. That's at a company level then. Is there anything at a, a government, a policy level that would help this to develop in the right sort of way and to maintain people's well-being as well as their productivity? Yeah, certainly. Governments uh, have an important role to play there too. So, for one, if uh, there are continued outbreaks of the of the uh, virus, one thing that governments can do to um, promote uh, teleworking or hybrid working modes would be to ensure um, uh, care, uh, so child care uh, and uh, paid paternity and maternity uh, leave for um, for taking care of the children uh, in case uh, the, of school closures or kindergarten co closure. So that's that's one important um, policy and that would especially benefit women who during the pandemic have actually taken the, uh, the um, a larger role in terms of care giving activities, child care. Um, and another policy that uh, governments can uh, can can take is to um, ensure that the labor laws and regulations actually uh, specify the conditions under which workers can request uh, teleworking or hybrid working modes and to ensure that uh, workers who are working from home um, either the whole time or just for part of the time are treated uh, in the same way, are treated fairly and are paid exactly the same way and I have access to the same care and benefits as those who work uh, in the office. Okay, Milena Nikolova from the University of Huntington in the Netherlands, thank you very much for speaking to us. Now, a huge increase in government debt will be another legacy of the pandemic. That's one of the subjects that was discussed at the spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. But a UN-commissioned report has warned that the pandemic debt relief measures for developing economies don't go far enough and that many countries risk massive debt crises in the future. Kate Moody's here with more on this. Kate, can you remind us first of all of what debt relief measures are already in place for developing countries? Well, Stephen, both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have committed billions of dollars to help countries with emergency loans and grants to cover existing debt repayments. The understanding is that governments would use that extra funding to fight the pandemic. Those organizations, along with the G20 and the Paris Club of Creditor Countries, have temporarily frozen debt repayments for the poorest countries and offered them the chance to restructure their debt loads. Zambia, Ethiopia and Chad have asked for new negotiations. Now, private creditors own about half of developing countries' debt load. Many of them have refused to ease their terms, even during the pandemic. So what action is being called for in this area and how likely is it there'll be agreement? Well, creditors are being asked to extend that freeze on payments at least until the end of this year and to expand it to low and middle income economies. There are also ongoing calls for some debt forgiveness or cancellation. The IMF and World Bank have said without that, countries could find themselves buried by debt, even though their own rules don't actually allow them to cancel debt that's owed to them. Debt forgiveness will be the toughest thing to negotiate. Private creditors in particular have been reluctant to show flexibility, as have some of Beijing's official lending bodies. French President Emmanuel Macron has publicly urged a large part of Africa's debt to be cancelled, but so far there are no concrete steps in that direction. OK, Kate Moody, thank you very much. Now, with bars and restaurants closed for so much of the last year in France, winemakers have gone looking for new ways to sell their products. Many found themselves cutting out the middleman of the local wine shop and selling directly online instead. Erdogan Kay has the story. In an otherwise dismal year, relief for French wine producers. David Couturier produces between 8 and 10,000 bottles per year. His inventory is nearly sold out, but not due to purchases in his store, which he transformed into a logistics base for online sales last year. C'est une commande qui part à Brest. 
Pour un particulier, on vend 100% aux particuliers. A year ago, he only sold to shops. Now, everything has changed. On n'aurait jamais pensé que cela pouvait nous, nous, nous aider. On était sur les réseaux sociaux et on transformait peut-être une vente par mois ou deux ventes par mois. Aujourd'hui, c'est la totalité de nos ventes qui se font par ce canal. On aurait quasiment plus de ventes. On aurait les aides du gouvernement et on ferait très, très peu de ventes. Online wine sales have skyrocketed since the first national lockdown. This seller's revenues nearly doubled since March 2020, encouraging management to hire a second employee to help prepare the 30,000 bottles sold last year. On a une augmentation de fréquentation de plus de 55%. On a de nouveaux acheteurs, des novices sur Internet. Et en fait, on s'en est aperçu parce que euh, les gens nous appellent plus. On a plus d'appels euh, sur des gens qui, qui ne savent pas comment acheter euh, sur Internet. Donc, ils demandent des conseils. But after a record year, some industry experts wonder whether these new habits will last after the health crisis. En mars avril 2020, le commerce de vin en ligne a été multiplié par trois. Si vous regardez bien, la tendance s'est confirmée alors qu'on n'est plus confiné en tant que tel depuis le mois de mai dernier. Hein. C'est-à-dire qu'on peut se déplacer pour aller effectivement acheter des produits alimentaires, dont du vin. On peut aller chez son caviste. Donc cette tendance se confirme. Nationwide, one study found online wine sales were worth nearly 600 million euros in 2020. That's all from us for now. But if you want more global business stories, you'll find all of our previous episodes on the France 24 website. And if you'd like to get in touch with your comments or questions, you'll find me and the team on social media. Until next time, thanks for watching. At the end of September 2020, Azerbaijan launched a lightning war which left thousands dead in Nagorno-Karabakh. Within six weeks, the predominantly Armenian enclave had suffered a crushing defeat and large territorial losses. Today, how are the people of Karabakh coping with the trauma? And what role is being played by Russia, which sponsored the ceasefire? France 24 has been to Nagorno-Karabakh to find out. Reporters, presented by Mark Owen on France 24 and France24.com. Sudan, the land of the Black Pharaohs, is the new holy grail for archaeologists the world over. While some hope to get rich by plundering the ruins, others seek to protect the sites and raise popular awareness. <laughs> Don't miss this investigation by our reporters from the archaeological sites of Sudan. Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.